Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, once more to our lecture on introduction to finite element methods. Uh, this being our fourth lecture, this fourth or fifth, uh, we, we've looked at uh, the, the, the spring element, uh, the illustrative tool. We've looked at uh, the power element, both um, in uh, 1D and uh, oriented in 2D space. And uh, today we look at uh, the beam element, that type of an element. Now, um, so far, so far, so good. Uh, sorry for that delay. Uh, my computer was updating something on my computer, which took quite some time. But uh, that being said, I believe today will be a short one. So sit back, take your pen, let's learn together. So far, so far, so far. All right, all right, all right, right. That's okay with checking the audio. So when you talk about the beam element, if you recall, whatever you have been looking at, eh, whether it, it be the spring element, eh? so then we are talking of the spring element. Let me just make this a uh, large screen so that you can be able to see it is clearly. Whether we are talking of the spring element, okay, where maybe this side was fixed, then we applied a load be there, or we are talking of the bar element, uh, where we are assuming, let's even say that uh, it have got a different changing cross section, okay, okay. Whatever it is that the load was applied, eh? or even if we had, when we considered the bar element oriented into this space, okay, and let's uh, assume this uh, is fixed and the load was applied. So, you know, these things, what you consider this, or what, what you noted is that we are talking of load applied axial. So, we are talking of axial loading. So, axial loading, so what you expect was uh, the reaction. It be, of course, the actual reaction, the F on the X direction. If we take the, so the normal X direction to be this horizontal, okay? So the, the deformation uh, was uh, extension, uh, actual deformation, extension elongation, uh, elongation or compression, reduction in length, right? For spring, for bar element. And the load was by axially. Now, for the beam element, beam element, what you have to consider by definition, Beam element are long and the slender. These are long and slender elements, structural element. And when you talk of long and slender, sometimes we define in terms of uh, ratios of cross section. Okay, because you have something like this, eh? and then you have uh, this length. Eh? Okay, this uh, being the depth. Then we have the the breadth, of course, and then this is the length. Okay, there is. This now, this is a beam, okay? You could also have the same, uh, a slab have got the same dimension, but the thickness, the ratio thickness reduces, like a slab, something like that. Then you find this is the thickness, we call it T, which is the bread, of course, D, eh? and then this is the width, D. Of course, when you are designing this, we take it as one meter. Then this is le the length, per meter runner. Again, if you change the ratios, you can have a plate. Plate is very thin, but the geometry is the same. Okay. So for the beam, we define them as long slender structural member, generally subjected to transverse loading. So in this case now, we are saying the beams are generally subjected to, to transverse loading. I think I can I can remove this video to have more space. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, we are. Since my laptop is hanging again, this is a problem I was facing in the morning. This.
if I cannot clear my work in here, then I will translate to program. Seems like you're not working, but uh, I just wanted a space to highlight a few, a few uh, issues. Now we are saying for the beam, eh? now for for your beam, we are saying number one, saying number one. Eh? Uh, this now I, 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 I suppose to the bar element it carries the absolute eh? beams. Eh? So if we take uh, this being our beam member there. So the beam is supported there, it's supported at this point. So the beam uh, is usually subjected to transverse loading. Transverse are supposed to axial, okay? Axial, of course, is along the, uh, the axis of the member. Again, this is perpendicular. So transverse loading, it could be a point load, it could be a UDL, uniformly distributed load, whatever that be the case. Then um, this loading, because of this nature of loading, the transverse load, eh? What you expect, the of course, there is the action, which is the load. The reaction will be, or uh, the, the output this causes uh, bedding. So this one will cause bedding, okay? Based on, of course, fixity here, that's why I'm sketching like this. This side was fixed, if it was uh, just, um, um, what you say, uh, simply supported, then there will be rotation here on this head, okay, like that. So this bedding, there will be no twisting or the actual effect as we expected in the bar. Of course, twisting is brought about by moment. Eh? So the bedding deformation, our bedding now is measured in terms of this displacement, the transverse displacement. Our bedding will capture it in terms of this vertical displacement, which we are calling the transverse V, as well as the rotation at, at the support. Because if let's say I'm saying if this is a if this is um, simply supported, we talk of the rotation here. Of course, if it's fixed, if the, your beam is built in here, okay, uh, then it deforms like that, eh? then there's no rotation of the support, okay? I know you already know this because you've been handling much about beams and uh, different type of support. So therefore, we consider that for the for the bar element that we are talking about, eh, the, there was only one degree of freedom per node. Eh? One degree of freedom element in the in element in the local coordinate system, of course. So which was the transverse displacement? Okay. Now no, the axial displacement. But for the bar, uh, for the beam element, the degree of freedom is that you have the rotation theta, and of course the vertical displacement uh, v or dy. So it will be transverse displacement as well as rotation. So there are some assumptions that we make. In deriving the finite, because of course you know the finite element uh, equation, which you call the equilibrium equation, is supposed to f is equal to k delta. Okay, so the first step is usually determining the uh, stiffness matrix. Okay, so we'll be tasked with the uh, given the task of deriving the stiffness matrix for a beam element, which for this task I'm not going to go much into details. We can always refer to the some materials that I've shared in this platform sometimes back. Uh, but it should not be difficult. What I want us to know today is a few uh, assumptions that are made with, for this der derivation from elementary beam theory. Of course, most of you might have got it, but uh, from the uh, theory of simple bedding, you, this is when you derive this equation. It should be in the strength of materials, or um, material mechanics, or structures, whatever you, you know, the cost code might have been called for different people. So M of I is equal to F of Y is equal to uh, e of R. Okay. E of R. R. So this is when you drive this equation. This is what you call the, 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 the equation of simple bedding from the beam theory. So the assumption is, eh, just as you had the assumption in the spring, the assumption in the environment, in this case, you have the first assumption that uh, the beam is loaded only. So our beam will only be loaded uh, So the beam, before we come to the sign conversion, we are saying our beam, this is our beam. Okay. So the beam is loaded only 
in the y direction. So we have this axis as a y, and then we have this as a x. So the beam will only be transverse, the loading will only be transverse. Then number two, of course, deflection of the beam are small in comparison to the characteristic dimension of the, the beam. Eh? So we are talking of small deformation. You become to understand the theory of small deformation and large deformation. So we are, talk, we are saying this deformation uh, uh, delta is small. This is small compared to, of course, the, the length or the, 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 the dimensions of the beam, eh? the length, the L. Eh? So that uh, we are within what you call the small deformation uh, theory. Number three, we assume a material which is uh, linear, elastic. And this is a, a feature that uh, is important to understand. Eh? When we talk of a material which is uh, linear, okay, then we say it's uh, elastic or linear elastic. Then we talk of isotropic. Then we talk of uh, homogeneous. This is our perfect material we are considering. Of course, linear, linear meaning that uh, it uh, obeys the Hooke's law, F is equal to. Of course, a material that we are dealing with in the finite element analysis, eh, it's kind of have to obey this. Otherwise, you might not be able to derive the, the, the equation. Our equilibrium equation is based on this uh, fundamental equation, the Hooke's law. So it's for linear, a linear elastic range. Uh, then elastic, of course, of course, this is what we are talking about. Us. Then isotropic. I wanted to differentiate between isotropic and then uh, uh, isotropic and homogeneous. Uh, isotropic material is a material that is uniform in all directions. Consider a case like a concrete cube. So this concrete cube. Okay. So if you do the uh, the compression test. Eh, it doesn't matter whether you test this cube. Let's call this face, face uh, A eh? and let this face B. Even if you turn it the other way around, that the face B comes on top. Huh? See? The face B is on top. The face A now is here. We expect the strength to be the same for concrete. We, so the material have got uniform characteristic in all direction. So it's isotrop isotropic. But this will not be the case for Atiba. Remember, let's say you take a cross-section from Atiba Plank, eh? let's say you have a long section of a tiba, then you take some pieces. Eh? So, this one you are testing it for maybe compressive strength. You apply the load here, and the grains are running like this. Okay, this would be different if you take the same piece, the grains are running like this, and then you load it across the grain. And that's why for tiba, a design of tiba structures. We always specify whether the stress uh, given is maybe the permissible stress along the grain, across the grain, and so on and so forth. So we talk of Tiba being, uh, yes, homogeneous, but it's not isotropic. The characteristics of the material are not uniform uh, in all direction. So that should stick into your mind. And we have many examples, uh, many materials having that characteristics that you find that uh, they have one, one uh, in one direction, it's, it's so strong. But in that direction, which we try not to try, maybe it's weaker. Now, when we talk of uh, derivation, because there is the issue of uh, the sign convention. Eh? So, <clears throat> in this, there are a few things that you have to note in uh, finite elements when we are deriving the stiffness matrix and the finite element equation for the beam element. The issue of the sign convention, for, as opposed to what you have been considering for the case of the the, the normal, the normal beam theory. So in the, when you are deriving about uh, equation in the beams, eh, you talked of uh, let your beam being like this. Eh? Okay, you talked of uh, the moment that cause, <clears throat> or we call them the the hogging moment and the sagging moment. Uh, this is a sagging moment because it cause this this beam to sag like this. Okay. Maybe you may have, uh, you may still be remembering that. If not, just here refreshing. Uh, if the moment were like this, which you call the hogging moment, they will, they will cause your beam to deform, to hog, to deform like that. Eh? Okay. So let's stick with our, let's stick with the sagging moment. 
And uh, so we are saying, for purposes of sign convention, you are talking of for the sign moment for of, for the bedding movements that cause the beam to bend concave upward, like the way we have it here. So this one we talked of them being a positive sign convention. Those this moment moment are positive moment. Number two, the shear forces are positive if they cause a beam to rotate clockwise. So if a beam, if the shear force is clockwise, of course, eh, you know it's like this. Eh? So if that is a shear force, then the other one have to come like this. It's kind of a, they made a curve. So this is when we say that these are positive shear forces, positive V, capital V. Remember, small V, we are using it for this uh, vertical displacement. But when we come to the theory, uh, or when we come to the derivation uh, of, uh, of when we are dealing with the, the finite elements, mean as a finite element, then the sign conversion changes slightly. Because we say, Moments are positive in the counterclockwise direction. So you can see from whatever we had in this, uh, what we had in this, uh, let me get a different color. So what we had in this, uh, yes, this is counterclockwise, so this would be positive in our case. But this is clockwise, so this would have been a negative moment. Okay. So we are saying for our beam, uh, if our beam is like that, uh, if you have a beam like that, then positive movement have to be in the same direction, counterclockwise. Number two, rotation are positive in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. So when you talk counterclockwise, remember we are measuring from the horizontal x axis. Okay. So if like this is the deformation, if this is the deformation, let's say there is a rotation here like this. Eh? So we have this rotation here, theta, and the rotation of this support theta. So this was simply supported. So if I am at this point, then I look at this. When I come at this node, eh, I see this is in the, in the this x direction, x coordinate. So this is on the negative side. It's a uh, clockwise. So this is negative rotation. Okay. While this, when I'm on this point, eh, when I'm on this node, eh, it means this is in the positive or, or it's, in, it's in the counterclockwise direction. Therefore, this is positive rotation. Okay, that's the difference. Eh? Of course, forces are considered to be positive in the positive y direction. You see, for the shear force, the normal the beam uh, conversion, we are talking of uh, we are talking of uh, the beam uh, like this shear force being positive upward, and this one being positive downward because they make this uh, beam uh, to rotate uh, clockwise. But in our case now, for the finite element, because this is downward, this force shear force. Eh? then we expect it to be a negative shear force. So the sign conversion, forces are positive in positive y direction. Again, displacement are positive in the positive y direction. So from the, this axis, so this, this displacement here would be negative uh, dy or negative d. Okay? So those, that is a difference between uh, the two sign conversion. Now with that in mind, you can go ahead and uh, now have <coughs> What we are talking of uh, as the, I don't know why some of them don't want to get the rest, but we are not going to dwell on that. Okay. So with that, now we move ahead, we get, um, <coughs> the sign conversion that we are talking about this, just a summary of what I've just given, that uh, the top one, the top, um, the top sketch shows the sign convention for the case of uh, uh, the bar. I mean, for the case of the finite element sign convention, the lower sketch or the bottom sketch shows now the standard sign convention that you are used to uh, in the beam theory. Yeah? So we use the first. So that's so that you can see the first is showing positive component. <laughs> The first one, uh, this is showing when, um, when uh, you know, this is the x-axis. So it's showing, so this is showing like positive moment. You see the positive moment, they are counterclockwise. Then uh, for this to be positive rotation, it have to be, you know, it's, it's bending on the bottom, uh, lower part. 
And then for this to be positive for this side, then it has to uh, the rotation has to be above the x-axis so that it will be in the uh, counterclockwise direction positive. Then what else? Uh, the forces, of course, even moment of course, the forces, you know, they are upward. Forces and displacement have to be upward, rather it's downward, right? then uh, they will be negative. So having understood that, uh, so the, uh, you see the above is FEA beam, and then the bottom is beam theory. So we take a, a sample or a, an element, beam element like this, and then we are showing we have got two nodes. At per node, we have two degrees of freedom, which is uh, theta, rotation, and uh, V, which is uh, displacement, vertical, transverse displacement. And uh, you have to note that, uh, of course, input or the action bring about the action. When you apply the node of force in a member, pull, external force, you expect deformation, actual deformation to be associated with uh, the axial load. So in this case, the rotation, rotation will only, will, will, okay, is associated by the by movement. No, movement are the one to bring about the rotation. Or vertical displacement is associated with the applied axial force, which can also be the reaction. So that's why you are seeing all these quantities. Eh? They are uh, grouped together with the, I mean, the, how they are related. Rotation, it's with the moment, vertical displacement related with the axial applied load. You are given material characteristic. Remember, you said the stiffness matrix and composites both the geometry and material characteristic. So E, Young's model represents the material characteristic. I represents the geometry. Eh? The second, uh, the moment of the notch. So not IJ. Okay. Of course, now this is the notation, what we are calling each and all this. Um, of course, you know, some of them, we have used them before. Mm -hmm. L, I, E. Okay. V, again, remember the other time you were talking of U in a, in a bar, where you said U varies. So you say it's a function of the length. Eh? So same case, vertical displacement. What, what, what are you talking about here? So you are saying, in, in, this, in this particular case, uh, let's say that there's the deformation that will occur. Let's, let's assume uh, theoretically some hypothetical deformation like that. So what we are saying is that from this length, we say any, any, any distance from the support here, let's call it distance x, so that at this point, x is equal to L. So we are saying at any one point, v is a function of x. Okay, and that's why it's continue varying as the distance x changes. Eh? So this is what this expression means. Uh, rotation, of course, this is from uh, the theory, maybe. Rotation theta is a, a fast uh, derivative of the displacement. Uh, of course, the force f is a function of uh, that movement. The same case is a function of the length. So those are just a simple notation which uh, shouldn't confuse you. Now, from the area of bedding with that, eh, you can uh, neutralize, and I can give some hints, eh, because the other step now, you are going to use this to uh, come up with a, a stiffness matrix. So what you do, some hint is that you have, the slope is already given here. So we, we already have the slope that's given here. Then another thing is that uh, the uniformly um, distributed load, eh, uh, which we call, no, no, the moment, mx, which is this part here, is the second derivative of the displacement. And now we include ei. Of course, we include the material characteristic, ei. Uh, d squared v of dx squared. When you come to the, the shear force, which are these forces here, this, uh, F or whatever you can call it, V, capital V, not that, is equals to EI, D, cubed X over DX, cubed. And you can go on and so forth, and then they apply load. If you have a load W, which is a UDL, it's expressed as a, as a fourth derivative of the slope, EI, 
a is power four x. Um, not this is not exist here over dx is power four. So the first step when you are driving the stiffness matrix is to assume or select a displacement function. Okay. So either way, if you you select that you can select a displacement function either from this f, um, then you try this equation to the right. Okay. But uh, that's not the uh, focus of today. So you, you can refer to some uh, material I shared sometimes back. It's in this channel, so you can refer to it. How to derive the stiffness mark for the beam element. Because when you do that, you're going to end up with this equation. Where this part is a stiffness matrix. This is now the displacement vector. This is the force nodal force quantities. Of course, now of the force here, we are talking of the applied nodal quantities, eh? which is the moment and the sign of force. And then you shall see, for each one of these now, we have the uh, axial or the, the lateral displacement and uh, the rotation, lateral displacement and rotation, associated with lateral displacement, associated with the uh, axial, uh, the lateral force or the reaction, the rotation associated with the moment. Okay. So it's, it's quite easy again to have a record of this if you partition this like this. Why, why have you, uh, if you have noticed something, one of the features of the stiffness matrix is that they are symmetric. So if you take the main diagonal, you take this as the main diagonal, of course, whatever is below here can be mirrored. Number two, you can be able to partition them. Why? We are talking of a, an element with two nodes. So it's a node here and a node here. So we expect. For equilibrium, when you take out this element, the behavior, the characteristic here, and the characteristic here to, I mean, the, the quantities to, to balance. And that's why you find for a stiffness matrix, you are having like repeated quantities. So you, if you look carefully, you are seeing this first quad quadrant is the same as the last, eh? with the sign introduced in the minor diagonal. And this sign uh, as a result of, of course, after you derive, you agree to get this, but this comes as a result of the sign convention, okay? Then you see this quantity is this quantity here, but of course this value, the only value that needs this four becomes two. And then of course now we have the sign on this uh, vertical, the first column. And this quantity is this here with a sign now on the uh, row, the top row. So that's just a way that I came up with to record this. Eh? Because uh, in an external setup, in, a, in a, an exam setup, you might be given this. Eh? But let's say you are doing your own calculations. Eh? Uh, maybe you don't want to keep on referring to this. So some of these simple things, though in engineering we are referring, uh, we, we usually do references. When you are even doing our design, we use the code. Eh? But uh, let me tell you, when you start doing the design, let's say you, you, you are designing a multi-story building and uh, have got uh, maybe a steel tower on top and you have got Tiba, you know, uh, decking somewhere. You are going to be employing so many codes. So if you if, if you if you don't know some of this equation, you keep on flipping on main pages so many times. Eh? So basically, it's it's good to have at your fingertips some of these uh, simple, especially the simple expression, because there are some which are rather complex. Eh? So this simple one, then you find a way of recording uh, them. But I'm not advocating on cramming per se. <laughs> it's just shutting you up. You are memory, and that's it. This is our stiffness uh, finite element equation for the beam element, and uh, the K can clearly be seen as such. Okay. So let's 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 look with an example. Let's look to an example. You see the application of this. I'm move, moving quite fast because now you have already um, done a number of uh, computation on the finite elements using the bar and the streaming spring. So you are level acquainted with the steps or the stages that we follow in the solution or in solving these kind of problems. So we are given a, a beam. A beam mass can be seen here. And then this beam is fixed. So this head is fixed here and is fixed here. Okay. Then there is some movement that is applied at the middle and uh, also uh, a, lot, a vertical uh, load force F, uh, P is applied. The material is given as EI. So even without further ado, if EI, you just know K for whatever element you do because the material property is the same, it will be EI of L cubed into bracket, you talk of uh, 12 
uh, 6L, then 6L, 4L squared. I take this one here. We have 12, 6L, or minus 6L, 4L squared. So I put negatives on the minus, uh, minus diagonal. Then again, here we have minus 12, uh, 6L, then minus 6L, 2L squared. Then I take this one here, and then I change the sine cosine negatives to the row. This will be minus 12, minus 6L, 6L, 2L squared. So basically this is the, sorry, sorry for that. So that will be, that will be the sign. I mean, the, that will be the stiffness matrix for whatever element that you have. Then number two, you look at all that is given you have seen. So you are required to determine the diffraction and rotation at the center node. So because of the applied load, we expect to have a, a deformation. We expect to have a deformation somewhere, a deflection. This is just hypothetical. Because of this moment, maybe you may have some different kind of uh, uh, deformation, but you're going to see from the values of K. So we, ex we are, you are to determine this D, but small D, or you can say DY. And then we also require to get theta at this node. Now, the first step, discretize and select element type. So element type we are is the D. Discretizing, uh, of course, we, we have the criteria that used for uh, determining the node location. And the, uh, I make a short uh, review of this. Uh, I think I posted it this week. You can look at a short video that I made on how to select a node. It's a nine minute video, short one. So we said one of the things is that at the support, we have a node. So this is another node. And the point of load application. So now this it means this is node one, node two, node three, okay? That's that's enough. So you may have other, other, other criteria that you may use to locate nodes based on the cross-section. So make sure you watch that. Uh, it will help you in understanding in a quick way the location of nodes. So you have two elements, and each of these elements have got uh, K as shown here, because the L is causes L for each one of them. So we move ahead now. With K1 and K2, we can do what we call the assembly of the Stephens matrix. And what you do for the group of K, you just need to get for the K1, you know you'll be having V1, uh, theta 1, V2, theta 2. So for the K2, basically the, the, the stiffness matrix is the same, but now if this is K2, okay, if this is K2, why is not selecting? So if this is K2 now, then here you have V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. So your matrix will be will be containing V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. So what we do now is just a matter of using the principles for imposition, compatibility condition, you can be able now to match K1 and K2 to come up with K1 is like that, K2, you, know, you, see, you can see they are the same, right? the matrix are the same, that they, they represent different quantities. Why are they the same? Because the material property is the same, the geometry, the, the geometry, the cross section is the same, and the length is the same. So if you go ahead and have a global finite element matrix, so we have V1, theta 1, V2, theta 2, V3, theta 3. And uh, <clears throat> you see the quantities which were, if you look carefully, these are the part that there was a sharing of nodes at V2, theta 2 that will be having some additions of from this matrix, uh, matrix for element one and element two. Okay, so this is not by mistake. Eh? Element we do not them by a number and circuit. The node we do not, we just leave them there. And then uh, once you have got K, so this is a K, or this is a K. With that there we have, this is the, the information, uh, uh, or quantities, the way we call it, uh, whether, whether you want to call it the delta, whether you want to call it the use, then this is, will be the F sign. Okay. F is equal to KU. So with this now, you go ahead and solve uh, equation, this equation. 
So to do that, we need to reduce it. Otherwise, the way it is, they have put so many unknowns. And we do that by invoking boundary body problem. And by invoking boundary body problem is that we are fully defining our problem. Because as I said from lecture number one, that we are solving finite element method, we are solving a boundary body problem. So without defining the boundary conditions, then we have not fully defined uh, our BVP. Right. So if you look at this, based on the, the support condition, this is fixed. This is fixed. So of course I know from uh, your past experience, you expect this deformation to be like this. Okay. I'm enlarging it so that you can see it clearly. So because of this fixity, the rotation here, beta 3 is 0. The same case with beta 1 is 0. Again, this is fixed. You don't expect any vertical displacement of this. So V1, same case with V3, is equal to 0. Okay. So you just come here now. This one will be 0. This one is 0. This one is 0. This one is 0. And uh, now to simplify your equation, you remove the rows and the columns associated with the quantities having 0 values. Eh? So you move all that, you are going to be left with the quantities for B2, theta 2, which is this part. B2, theta 2, associated with this part. Okay. So this is our boundary condition. Of course, we are given the quantities M2 is equal to M, and it's positive. Look at the sign convection. Eh? Remember the sign convection? Positive counterclockwise. Load. If the uh, ax vertical axis is this, so the load is applied uh, downward, of course, so this will be negative. So the load, F2I, the force on node 2 is negative P. The moment is positive. And then we have this as zero term. So we have our reduced equation like that. Okay? And with this, though, it's very simple. Simple algebraic equation. Simultaneous algebraic equation that you can solve very quickly. So you solve that. And I hope by now you have done proper practice in, uh, on the solution of uh, simultaneous equation using the matrix method there. Okay? How to get the inverse of uh, this matrix so that on this side you only be left with the Vs and the Vs. The degrees of freedom, which are 2, theta 2, which is equal to like this. Of course, this we are writing in matrix form. This tells you that uh, V2 is equal to minus VL cubed over 24. E i and the theta two is equal to uh, three l m all m l over two e and twenty four e i. Okay, the reason that we are writing it in matrix form. So we we start now. We, mm -hmm. You can clearly see. You can clearly see that uh, we have obtained. For the nodal unknown, nodal degree of freedom for the node 2, V and theta. So we move ahead to determine or to evaluate uh, the other unknown quantities. So this is a global finite element equation. We go ahead to obtain the reaction forces at the moment. And as you can see, of course, the V2 and theta 2 are unknown. Okay. So we can invoke. Um, F1, M1, F3, M3, you know that, you obtain these quantities. So it's just, just a, a matter of going back to your uh, original equation. So here with me today, some of these things are not getting erased. Huh? I'm just hoping it's not the issue with the, with the streaming platform. Okay. And what we are saying is, you just have to come here and, uh, as you can see, You have determined this quantity. You have V2, theta 2, you already know V1, theta 1, you already know V3, theta 3, you already know F2, M2. So to get the other reaction, what is remaining is F1, Y, M1, F3, Y, M3. So you can just take an equation, which is uh, the top row equation, is the one that gives you F1, Y. So F1, Y is 12, V1, which is 0. Then 6 times 0, minus 12 times V2. So F1Y, actually, we can even do it here, like um, F1Y, you can quickly see, F1Y is, uh, 
this is a vertical reaction. It's equal to this minus 12 times uh, this, because the others were zero. If you multiply the first one times this, zero. So this one you can only uh, avoid confusion if you already know how to work out or to matrix operation, how to multiply um, matrix opener. So this will be um, minus 12 V2, then plus 6L times theta 2. So plus 6L theta 2. Then the rest will be zeros. If you multiply zero times V3 is zero, zero. So you are, if you do that, you're going to get what is F1, Y. Already you have determined what is V2. You have already determined what is 6, uh, I mean theta 2. And this is what you are obtaining from um, from uh, this. So don't worry about what you are getting here. So this is the, we have only made with the quotas that are necessary to determine F1, Y. F1, Y, we have said this. Minus 12 times V2, 6L plus 6L times theta 2. And when you substitute what is what is a V2 from what you have obtained here, and what is theta 2, which you already determined here, okay, when you are going to get F1, Y is equal to a quarter 2P plus 3ML. And you can go ahead, if M was given and L was given, you can substitute, and P was given as a a numeric value, you can go ahead and substitute to get it as a single point. Okay. And that's it. It's very simple. Solution for this, very simple. Um, once you have determined the stiffness matrix, the other part now, the procedures we follow, just the same way we did. Because the good thing, the bit about the finite element uh, uh, procedures, uh, uh, method of our solution or analyzing our structures, is that no matter how complex our structure can be, we can break it down into finite elements. And then, no matter what type of finite element we select, even when you are using software, the procedures followed are the same. Okay. The challenge becomes like when we have many nodes. Of course, this is we expect to have many nodes in a real structure, maybe. So you expect to have a quite a, a quite large matrices, which might be tedious or even impossible to handle by hand. And that's why we need the power the computational power of, of computers. Let, let me mention something before we see another example. When we have uniformly distributed load, okay? so you have a case like that. You're talking of a, a distributed load, transfers. We have to convert this because we say both are applied at the node. Eh? We need to convert it into uniform, what we call a, an equivalent nodal load okay so we, to do this we utilize what we call the work equivalence method yeah work equivalence method i know you have tackled the issue of principle of virtual work and so on so we convert the uniformly distributed loads into fixed-head reactions. And fixed-head, of course, will be considered of the shear forces and the, and the fixed-head moment. So the UDL will be replaced by concentrated node of forces. So this is a node, this is a node. So we resolve this UDL to consider node of forces and a moment, which will change. That's why you are talking of it being equivalent. The node of forces, the way you resolve them, or the way you, 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 uh, yeah, you, you, you apply them here, Side convention is very important because they have to produce the same effect on the beam as the actual distributed load. Okay. So these uh, statically equivalent forces are always on opposite side from the fixed head reaction. You know, fixed head reaction was now what you've been uh, talking of in the other finite element, uh, I mean, other approaches in uh, theory of structures or structural analysis. So what happens in this case is that the sign convention is in the opposite direction. Okay. So if we have a case like this, eh, the fixed head, eh, if we have to get the fixed head reactions, eh, they'll be like this. This is your this is your beam, right? So this, of course, the UDL will be the, the load will apply Q L over two. The shear force, eh? Because we are taking half of this, we multiply by half, uh, the L. we are taking this, 
We're applying by this line, which is L over 2. Then we apply it here and we apply it. The same way we deal with the uh, okay. the UDL for the normal type uh, cases of analysis for one structure. Then for the fixed head moment or the reaction, we use the sign convection for the beams. Okay. So this will be QL squared or WL squared over 12. So why this sign convection? Remember, when you look at the way these flows are applied, eh, they cause the actual, which cause the bedding like that. It causes the beam to hog, not to sag, right? If the load was applied downward, it would cause the moment to sag. So if it causes the beam to hog, then you use the same convention from the beam theory, elementary beam theory, like positive moment, or the, these are the moments that causes uh, if they are applied at the node, they have to cause hogging. They have to cause this thing to uh, concave upward. Now we are saying for the finite element, the the sign is opposite this. So this whatever you are seeing here now, the sign will be opposite. So basically, for our case here now, the UDL that is applied now, the sign convection will be so that this will be acting upwards, and then the same case loads and so on and so forth. Okay, but of course the load will have to apply them for the moment. Okay, so let's see with some uh, example. I hope I have given some examples here. So this is what I was saying for the fixed head reaction. This is what you already know. So for the uh, in beam uh, in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a finite element approach, eh? so you see this apply loads W of a length L. Of course. I know resolving the load uh, in terms of the forces, not the forces, no problem, because it's just W L over two. You apply the data to support. Of course, the load is applying downward. That's okay. But for the moment, for for the moment, you see, if you are using the standard uh, uh, the, the normal beam convention, this moment causes hog sagging. So you'd have expected to have positive. Uh, a moment like this, we are applying like that. The equivalent of the loading. I, I hope I hope I'm not bringing any any position to you here in any way. Okay. And I'll give you another example here when we have maybe UDL, but it's very so these quantities are just a reminder you can obtain them from textbooks. Some of them you might have the right thing. Quantities. Then, when we have a point load, remember, remember, we have a point load. We can introduce a node here. But again, if we do not want to have uh, two elements, we just want to have one element. We can resolve this uh, point load. We can take it to a subset. You see, this is what we are saying. We divide it by two, and then the moment obtained are like this. Let me show you with this example. For this case, you see the load is applied down one T. This is a UDL. The material is EI, length L. Then you have to find the deflection and rotation of the free head. We expect this uh, cantilever beam to deflect like this. So you are required to get what is this V, small V. Don't confuse small V with the capital V because capital V is shear force. And that's why maybe in some books, this small V, you don't think. Uh, lateral displacement will be denoted by DUI. Okay. Right. So you have to get that, and also you have to get the, the moment, if there is any moment. Moment at the support. Of course, at the free, there, there can be any moment. So there will be moment developing at this support. Okay. So the first thing first is to resolve our <clears throat> our apply loads, uniform free loads, eh, using work equivalence method to Get nodo, equivalent nodo, was it? Okay. So of course, uh, for the case of the, for the case of the the, the load, applied load is quite direct, eh? because uh, we are going to get uh, the load here, P P L over two, half of it coming on this side and half of it coming here to support. So this is P P L over two. Okay, acting in the same direction, of course, as the load, because it will produce the same effects. Now, for the moment, you see, 
this moment, you know, the Lord is acting downward. So what effect does it have on this? Um, what effect you look at it have on this? Uh, it, it, the normal time conversion, we could say, the moment causes the, 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 the hogging. So in case of our finite element, it's the other way around. It's opposite. That's what I wanted to clarify from the other thing. Okay? That's why you have found in the moment in the opposite direction. Hogging, this means it's well like that. Sagging would have been like that, which we do not expect that. Okay? Right. So F, of course, now is given as a P alpha 2. You know that? The moment is given by this fixed head moment, you know, WL squared over 12. Right? And it's positive. So, the question, uh, we have just one element. So, quickly, getting the stiffness, of course, you know it. Okay. Then, uh, we want it on, we have one or two nodes, we want it on, we put the two. And you go and, and solve this equation. You invoke the boundary condition. What condition do we have for this uh, particular case here? You find that the uh, at the support, this uh, this edge is fixed. Node one is fixed as a support, eh? so we do not expect to have any vertical displacement. So F two y is equal to not force. Sorry, 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 sorry. This is a uh, v one, and also rotation theta one is equal to zero. Why? This this is fixed support, so there will be no rotation at the start. And then it starts spreading like that. So at the exactly the support, there's no rotation. And so you're saying V1 theta 1 is equals to V1 and theta 1 is equals to 0. Then M2, because this is the moment applied here, we have already determined it here. Then uh, F2i, you know this axis downward, so it will be negative F. Okay. So you substitute by even uh, substituting this is equal to 0, this is equal to 0, you will only be left with. This part, this part, okay. And with that, you can go ahead and uh, have your reduced equation like this, and uh, you solve for v two theta two, okay. So v two theta two again is expressed in matrix form, but you know this is v two is this quantity here minus p over four eight e i, and then theta two. Is this quantity here? So, what is the code of view from these uh, examples? Is really make sure you do the hard calculation so that uh, uh, <clears throat> the concept fit, fits into your system. Right? Okay. So, again, now from the group of finite element equation, you can go back and substitute. Already we have calculated the unknowns. We have uh, what is the uh, V2 theta 2. We want to get the reaction, uh, the reaction that support. So, F1y, M1y. So you just need to come and uh, you trace this first equation here to get what is F2, F1y at the support here, what is the vertical load, and what is the moment, inhibit moment at that support. So you find it like that. And you can see this is, these are positive. Eh? So it means the reaction is upward. Why should it be upward? It's so obvious. You see, this load is applied downward. So we expect uh, the reaction. This is the action. The reaction is upward. Opposite direction. Again, the moment is a positive. This means it's counterclockwise, like that. All right. So I give you something of a practice. You look at this uh, equation. You are given uh, required to solve using direct stiffness method. Yes. And once you do the sketching, can you do the you you, you calculate the, the, the moment? You can be able to go ahead and sketch the shear force and the bedding moment diagram. So what is given here? A load P is applied vertically downwards. This is a lot of support, right? The beam have got a constant TI, so the material properties are the same. Because you are looking at it, the nodes have already been indicated one, two, three. So you have element one, you have element two. Okay, it's about this is fixed, so it means no rotation here. So by now you can even anticipate you are something rotation to be something like this. Eh? Sorry, to be something like this. 
Sammy, maybe. maybe. Okay. So go ahead. So first you need to get this K. K is standard because here is the same. Then you get a combined stiffness matrix, so the assembly of the strain matrix of the structure. Then you invoke the boundary condition to reduce your matrix. You solve for the node unknowns. Okay. So when you are told to solve the problem of plot country, you require you are to determine the unknown nodal quantities. So in this support, we know we, we don't know the reaction. So you need to obtain the moment and the uh, shear force of the vertical reaction. So at this, we know that we are going to have a rotation theta. Of course, vertical displacement here is zero. So we are going to get what is theta two. In this uh, node one, what is required is the V1, the displacement. Okay. So this is a solution you should uh, uh, target to see whether you can get something like this. For the shear force, this is a typical case. And then for the bedding moment, it's something like that. Of course, before you get to this, this is the last stage. Eh? You have done all the calculation. Right, quite. So another practice example you could look at is now a case here. Some of these have been solved maybe in the past past years. Eh? But uh, for you, for your practice, it's good to, to go through them, um, do your exercises, so that uh, you get hard on experience instead of I solving all of them here. On the screen. If there is any problem, then you can always raise it, then we address it together. Okay. So here we have introduced a spring. So this, this becomes interesting here because now in this spring, we have the fourth element. You see, we have no the third element. We have the fourth node. We have node one, two, three, four. I'll make sure you, you order that thing on the, the, the that, 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 that small video on uh, location of node because. You not always be given this note. Eh? It's upon you to decide where you locate the note. And you might not have a note in the similar location, like another person. Because we have even found like where we have a load, eh? we know the load is applied at the node. If we want to have the, just that one node at the other, we can resolve this force to the support. Okay. Or we can introduce a new node. Okay. So here we have beam element plus the spring element. So go ahead and uh, see where you can be able to determine the differential, the rotation, and the actual forces. And these are the typical solution. I call this the typical because uh, maybe assuming there is a, some error in punching the calculator, you might find the variation. But let's see where you can get the quantity that I had calculated some years back. Okay. And that's it. So you can see it's it's, it's quite a short uh, short uh, session with a short, short uh, lecture uh, on beam element. But uh, make sure you know how to derive uh, the equation for the beam element. Now in the next, maybe I, I believe maybe you might be having another class, but uh, I want to welcome questions. I'm looking at the chart in the chat area. This class is usually silent. Eh? The other years, we should have questions in the chat area. Or maybe the understanding is quite high. Eh? Oh, I get it. It's because uh, I have shared the notes with you early enough. Usually, we don't share the notes before the lecture. But then I say, let's try this differently so that you have gone through them. Anyway, in case of uh, any question, either now or later on, even when you are going, uh, you are revising through this video on your own, you can always ask a question. Usually, I prefer people can post it there because I can address it during my free time, and other people can also benefit. But sometimes you might have a question which maybe it can't be tightened, which can be typed in the, in the comment. So you can end up sending an email. But if you send me an email, then it means I have to see where you are, your work is, so that I can see where you are stuck. And I don't know. I have seen students even from outside Kenya sending me a question. And then I say, this guy is just sending me assignment. No, no, no. This is not like uh, Coursera or where do you say? Uh, this this is a website where solutions are solved. Of course, we have a channel for that because I realize there are people who are genuinely interested in getting a solution of a problem, but this is outside the classwork. So we have a link where when you go to the download section, because there's somewhere you can go and download all the stuff you have in here. That's where now, based on how your membership, then you can ask a question and be solved. But for our classwork, let's do uh, as much practice as possible. If you are stuck, then you can always. Uh, why or consult? So, any questions so far? None. 
All right, all right. If, if no question, then allow me to stop it at that. I found that only if I give a link, then uh, people just join in and then no question left. Uh, so I want to get a question from the chat box. All right. I'm looking at the calendar. We are so much going into the semester. And I wanted us to have our first year team. So discuss amongst yourself and let me know. Let me know from your class representative. It will be a physical one. So I give you two weeks for preparation. And uh, class let me know before the end of this week. Eh? The other thing is that just to emphasize that by now you should have done something on uh, it, it's my it's my hope that you have done something on on final judgment, eh? especially installing and uh, going through that tutorial. Our CAT will cover up to this place we have covered today. Yeah. Of course, the other material that you are going to cover in the next week will not be that uh, CAT. Eh? So start doing practices first now. Okay, there being no question, that's the end of today. Thank you for your attendance. Then let's meet next week. That's it. I'm waiting for your uh, for your response once you consult with your members. Eh? So bye bye for now. Okay, just uh, just uh, something small that I've seen, a question here. I've seen a question. People are saying that uh, the issue of the overhead joist. Uh, initially, what you are supposed to do is that once you install the student version documentation, you are then supposed to... You, okay, are, su just, you, you, you are supposed to do what? To access the documentation, you are supposed to use the uh, Internet Explorer. But I'm informed that uh, the Internet Explorer currently is discontinued, so they are using Microsoft Edge. Uh, well, it's okay. I can send you the PDF with the overhead joist. I'm worried because if you can't access the documentation, because that's where the tutorial is, how are you going to, to, to follow the example? So I believe in as much as I'm going to send the documentation, I mean the, the tutorial, I mean that question, you seriously need to access the documentation. So try Internet Explorer if you can get the um, Microsoft Internet Explorer 11, or we try opening using Edge. Or in all the ways, try to access the documentation. Okay. I'm also going to try from my side uh, to see how it, you can access this. All right, so class rep, I'll be waiting for the confirmation when the CAT should be, but it should not go beyond uh, next week, but one. The CAT will cover up to where we have reached today. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attendance. Let's meet next time.